As you know, we got a $72 million one. All right. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in that one and why it's needed. So the first thing we look at is when we look at the slide presentation, we always look at these numbers. The current enrollment is here. So we have approximately 3,200 kids. The green, the red, and the yellow. Green means that we're under capacity. The yellow means that we're getting close to capacity. And the red means that we're over capacity. So in the elementary, in 2021, next year, we would be over capacity. In the middle school, we're next year over capacity. Excuse me, back up two years out in the elementary over capacity. Next year in middle school over capacity. And with the addition to the high school, we're clear out there uh, another three to four years. Break it down by section. So the elementary. If you look over here, you see that there are only two grade levels that are at 300 or more students. If we look farther out, 2024-25, you see that every grade level is above 400 students. So the elementary is growing at a rapid rate at this point in time. What I want you to see on the middle school is that capacity is 750. So right now we're at 736. Next year we'll be at 770. We can accommodate 20 more students above capacity. 837, we think we can accommodate that over capacity as well. That's approximately, you know, a little more than 90 students. But when we get to 934, uh, that's closer to 180 students. We don't know that we can do that at the current capacity of 750 kids, so we need to build into that plan. We're always asked at the high school, when are you going to be a class A school? Here's how they determine class A. Right now, they just came out with classifications. They take the 9, the 10, and the 11th grades, and they add that up. And anything 850 or more is class A. Well, if I take you right here, 2023-24, those three numbers in the freshman sophomore and junior class add up to exactly 850. Now nobody's um, forecasting that that's going to be true. It certainly is going to be a flux one way or the other. At this present time, that's when you could be a class A school. Okay? So those are the divisions. I want you to look at this one because up here, are the years. So if we look at this 22, 23, you're seeing middle school and elementary are necessary. Then you come out to 25, so three more years. You see elementary number six. You come out here, 26, 27. There's where you see high school number two. Okay? There is something floating out there that says, does this bond issue build a second high school? The answer is no. This bond issue puts money in the bond fund for land for a second high school. It is not building the second high school this time. Then you can see out here 28, 29, the seventh elementary. And then I want to talk about this third middle school. There's some flexibility for building in, whether it's here or maybe future down the road. District is said to be somewhere between eight and 10,000 students when it's all grown up, when every bit of development is done. So what I've done here is kind of give you some projections as to what those elementaries would be, middle schools and high schools as they look forward. If you go 8,000, obviously what I've said here is you need another elementary as you continue to go to some of those figures. But that is far down the road, at least a decade to two decades down the road before we get to these numbers. Where does it come from? Housing. In the last 15 years, in summary, we've added 15, excuse me, in the last five years, in summary, we've added 1,500 homes. We have about 300 homes new per year. 
We can look at that. It goes by subdivision and by grade level or elementary, middle school, high school. We look primarily at elementary. For example, in the Pine Creek subdivision, we know that every 55 homes out of 100 have an elementary student that go to the Pine Creek. We go over to Shadow Brook, which is across the street at 156. It's somewhere in the 30%. 33 out of 100 come into Pine Creek. So we have those numbers. But as you can see down here, there are a lot of empty lots ready to build on today. There are another 450 lots that are being graded or streets are being added to that sometime this year will be added to that 875. And there are another 1,500 lots that are simply paper that have been approved by a planning board and are ready to turn dirt so there is future growth that's going to occur in the district. These are all the subdivisions, those black dots with the house, that are in our district as of the last five years. So there's a lot of growth that have occurred, that has occurred in the last five years. The latest one is this Wood Valley West 2. As I drive around and I count homes in December, I was counting homes in Ridgemore, and I saw what used to be a dead end turned into a street. What used to be 22 acres now turned into 96 additional homes. So those things can occur. I, I do know when a lot of them come up, every once in a while, some will slip in. The other one that has um, been platted but it's not part of that 875, it's Kempton Creek, that's right across the road from Bennington Elementary at this point. These are a listing of the projects that we will have in the 72 month. That is something I believe Dr. Tyndall just handed out. So we'll go over each of these as we discuss and run through this slideshow. We got to talk about evaluation. Okay, evaluation of a home is a lot of times in the land. Uh, there's industrial, there's retail, there's many other pieces that go into property taxes. So the increase in that assessed valuation is very important. If I was to look at this side over here, you can see 10 percent until 2029. But as we look at that side over there, you see 8% for a couple of years, then 6% until 2020. Those are important. If it was to grow in this manner over here, that would be a zero increase on the land. This side over here, 10% increase until 2029, zero increase on the land. If I was to go over there, 8%, then 6%, it could go up to 4 cents which would equate to a house valued at $200,000. That could be an additional $80 per year. Now, here's the reality. We're close to 1.5 billion in assessed valuation right now. We have grown in the last 10 years, on average, almost eight and a half percent in assessed valuation. But we look down here at the last five years, we've grown over 11 in assessed valuation. So I'm always asked, well, how much will it cost? It always depends. But if we go with the last five years, then we're right in this zero increase on the level. Keep in mind, I'm saying zero increase on the level. I'm not saying zero property tax increase or decrease. The reason being is your assessed valuation on your property could go up. If that goes up, then your taxes go up proportionally with it. There are anywhere from 10 to a dozen different entities that collect property taxes. Now, granted, schools are about 60% of that property tax, but there's another 40% that comes from many different entities. Any one of those could raise the levy and increase property taxes. So, let me back to this. If it stays at that current rate, it's zero increase on the level. 
There's a couple other things. We have annual budgets for salaries, for lights, for many different operational expenses. That comes out of annual budget. It's again included in property taxes, included in state aid, and included in some other receipts like motor vehicle taxes. We have the least amount of revenue per student in the state of Nebraska. Last year, Miller had that number one ranking. This year, we'll jump that. We're waiting for those figures to come out in another week, but we already know what that is. What I'm saying is, if you buy a new home, chances are the property taxes on that new home are not going to be assessed in the first year. Normally, they're a year in the rear. State aid, which is 40% of our budget, is counted on last year's student growth, not this year. So the 325 students are not per se a part of that calculation. We can apply for that in terms of a student growth, but not all of those are reported. Therefore, the revenue that we get to run on an annual basis is typically a year behind that growth. And we have the least amount of revenue per kid. Let's talk about some of the projects that we have going on. This is a corner of 168th and military. It is the southwest corner. We have already purchased land both for the elementary and the middle school. We have not purchased all 80 acres of that. In fact, there's 15 to 17 acres at the top or to the north or closest to military that is still the landowner or still the original owner. The 80 acres that go to the west, still the original owner. We have approximately 60 acres in here. You're going to see something in the bond about off site street development. We have always been, or most of the time, we have been in developments or right on corners of roads. This is not the case here. So we're going to have to put in a road that goes from basically Stratford Park down here up to military up here. We also have to put in a road between the two. It takes traffic off of 168th and military, puts it here, and it creates more access. So they're not one central spot going to 168th or one spot going to military. It diversifies or spreads out that traffic. Talk about the elementary, or excuse me, the, the elementary site. This is in the blue, the elementary site. You can look at that, it's the same as Heritage, it's the same as Anchor Point, has that bend for it. The difference between this and Pine Creek, Pine Creek did not have a bend, it was a flat site, it didn't need the bend. Therefore, we're gonna build the blue. The two tan or pink areas are necessary for future growth. We're gonna talk about that with Pine Creek here. You can see the green could be developed down the road with the collaboration of youth organizations for more fields, which are obviously needed. And the traffic will come off of Rachel Snowden into the new road and in this parking. This looping system will be very similar in length to Pine Creek and Heritage. But obviously, it has a different standard. Very similar in terms of layout. We have the activities on this side of the entrance and a lot of the classrooms on that side. You could put future preschool like you do at Anchor Point, or you could put future classrooms, which we're going to talk about. We're always here. Okay, this is good. I know you need another school, but where is my kid going to play? Right? We developed the Anchor Point Attendance Center with that in mind. And so Anchor Point's Attendance Center, in all likelihood, is going to be cut in half somehow. And a lot of that will go to elementary number five. Yet to be determined, it will be in another year before we get there. Talk about the middle school. Middle school, 
is going to look very similar to middle school number one right now. The difference is we're going to expand some of the core areas, which I'll show you in a little bit. And these tan areas can, not in this bond issue, but will in the future, add three classrooms to each one of those grade levels. So nine classrooms total. This one is different in that we have to have that outdoor facility. We can't have the kids walk like they do at the high school to that other facility. So we have to have an inland track. We have to have a field in the middle of that. And there are going to be some competitions there. So it's about 500 seats for bleacher around that area as well. Here's what I'm talking about in terms of flexibility. You can see in the green that we're 736 students right now. That is a district size of 3,200, the bottom number. I take it out five years, right? But the current facility has 750 student capacity. You can think about that. That's sixth grade, 10 teachers, 25 kids per grade, right? 250 per sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, add up to 750. Now, when we look at that, if we have two of those buildings, that's about 1,500 kids. If we take that all the way out, what we're going to get is a district about the size of 6,500. So that takes us out past a decade. The second, uh, second middle school is there for quite a while before we even think about the third. Okay, the flexibility is here. If we were to add those nine classrooms around the outside, we could take that up to 975. That would be, instead of 250 per grade level, it would be 325. That flexibility then could take us just two middle schools up to about 85. Keep in mind, I said, the district's going to grow somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000. If we project out that it's going to be closer to 10,000, we need three middle schools. If we project out that it's going to be closer to 8,000, we simply go back and expand middle school number one, expand the classrooms to middle school number two, and we're down to two middle schools. So we're trying to build flexibility into the future as we move forward. Here's what the middle school looks like same concept. The blue is the expanded area. So bigger hallways, bigger support systems, like the extracurriculars, T and L would be a good example of that. The commons area, the library, the cafeteria. All of those would be expanded on the second level, down in the lower level. We got not a bigger gym. A floor is a very same size as any other floor, but you have more features. So that area has to be a little bit bigger. And then band locker rooms and the fitness center all expanded. Those areas, if expanded and stayed at 750, would not necessarily hurt productivity. Um, wouldn't necessarily be wasted like a empty classroom. Those things could be utilized as you move forward. Trying to build that flexibility. Here we are at Pine Creek. There's really five subdivisions in Pine Creek. Okay, Pine Creek being the biggest. Then you got Highland Hills that's pretty close second at this point in time and racing to catch up with Pine Creek. You got a Summer Hill Farm, Shadow Brook, and Water. Okay. If somebody comes to you and said, Well, I can take care of that you know, overcrowding on Pine Creek, you just move one neighborhood to another school. That's the easy way to take care of that. If we take Shadow Brook and Water further, I believe it's about 160. 160 kids at this point in time would not overcrowd, but would not fit in any one of our other elementaries. If you look at the productivity of right here, 266 kids right now in Pine Creek, just coming from Pine Creek subdivision, 266 kids, almost half of what is here. But we can't chunk out any of them and have them move or transfer or transition to another area. It's very difficult. I'm not saying it won't work. I'm saying it's extremely difficult too. Therefore, we take fully built out 
and we project how many kids are going to be per hundred, or percentage of elementary kids per hundred. Then we see we get a number here, 634. Well, if we add four more classrooms, we go from 21 to 25. If we have some flex rooms, three of them, which I'll show you in a little bit, we could go up to 28. If we have 23 kids in those 28 rooms, look at that, 640. We have room for 10 more, all right? What are those flex rooms? You've been a part of Pine Creek, you know what those flex rooms are. The research room changes into a kindergarten. The flex room or the computer room changes into a classroom. The art room, which I believe we're in, thank you, is a, another classroom in the music room. Those are four rooms, not three. And we take the addition outside the first grade in the kindergarten area, and we add those four classrooms. That brings us up. We think we have capacity at that point in time for future growth in this attendance center. We got to talk about stadium. What the Board of Education decided was at some point in time, there are going to be two high schools. What do you do with competition stadium? That's an expensive piece of realty. That's a big facility. They decided what is at Bennington High School now will be the competition stadium for both high schools. If you look at it, a Miller has one competition stadium for three high schools, a billion, one for two, and so on and so forth. Very similar complex here, right? We're just showing you the size of those stadiums. There are a couple of small ones there. Pius used to be a class B high school for many, many years. In Lincoln High, they normally go to Lincoln Seacrest to have most of their games, but Lincoln High, every once in a while, will have a lower division game or an intra city game that goes along with it. Most of the time, the capacity is around 2,500 up to 8,000. We currently have 2,200. We're trying to expand to almost 4,200. What's that look like? It's in phases, by the way. In blue is the one phase we're going to do this year. We're going to add to where the tumbling, rumbling hill is over here, where the um, ambulance sets, and we hope we never use. We'll add seating over there. We're going to add and expand the, the uh, restrooms and the concession stand now to accommodate that growth as we move forward. And on this side, not to be forgotten, is a press box, concession stand, and restroom for softball complex. Now, we're also redoing this parking. And why are we doing that? Well, if you remember on this side, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, some call it a natural speed bump, okay? Some call it a, you know. Teenagers. Yeah, and that could be that too. So, we're having to redo this whole thing. We need to get underneath there, fix some drainage problems, some water problems. So we think that that will help us maintain that cement for a long time. So those are the projects that go along with it. Phase two and phase three, take that plaza that is currently behind the bleachers and expand seating up. Therefore, we have to take the parking along that wall out. And then phase three goes to the visitor side, adds more seats over there, adds a restroom and a concession stand. Whether phase two and three come in one bond or two bonds, it's yet to be determined. It's phase one. That's the look of the concession stand and the softball area. Um, I took this. This is one of the restrooms, concession stands at the softball field at New Elk. Um, therefore, you see the restrooms on this side, press box up below, and session standing there. District office. Right now, it's being uh, built, it's under construction. The blue is a bigger footprint for what it will be. The black outline is what it was. It was three kindergarten rooms. That has been torn down, and they're now restructuring, building a two story building. This is the lower level. Of what it is, that's the boardroom. There's the office of the superintendent, reception area. This is being built right now. That simply is the second floor. 
We're asking in this bond issue to build out the remaining portion of that second floor in a new area. So why are we doing that? Here is the size of schools that we're comparing to right now. In two years, we'll be bigger than all of those. Okay? These are the amount of staff they have in their central office. As you can see, we're about half of what the others are. Okay? And by the way, we added Dr. Tyndall to that staff. So 13 now becomes the lucky number 14 in another year, right? We need more office space to operate in a bigger district. There are many other things that go along with that. We have to add security to heritage. Not that they don't have it now, but we're bringing it online with all of the other cameras. Goodness forbid if we have something happen and we have a lockdown situation, we have a system that we can hand over to outside authorities and they can look in those buildings along with us. We have to upgrade telephones. That's a part of that as well. Right now, the fiber connection for Pine Creek is wireless. It comes from the high school. And so there's a big tower up on the high school, big tower on this gym. And if it's a very windy day, there could be some outages that go along with it. So we're just simply building the fiber network, we're burying it. And we're looping it down 168, coming back down 156. Keep in mind that will bring on two other schools that go along with that. If the bond is approved, elementary number five, middle school will be a part of it as well. And then you see the parking lot. We have to add land. Everybody asks, but have you purchased it? Is that sign down State Street? Did you buy that? Not yet, okay? It could be there, it could be somewhere else. We always work. There's a couple of things that go along with it. Where are the people going to be? Because as you see here at Pine Creek, um, having it inside a subdivision like Pine Creek, particularly when it's warmer, you can get up to 100 bikes out here with people walking. That takes away car traffic. That helps in a lot of ways. And we have to have infrastructure. As you can see with elementary number five and middle school number two, if you don't have that infrastructure, you're going to be adding that infrastructure as you go forward. So those are the things that we look for when we're looking for land. What else does your money pay for? Okay? We're not always coming out and cookie sales and trying to get more facilities. Annually, these are some of the things that uh, Edison Public Schools have known. Three out of four years. Created excellent. I can count on one hand in the state of Nebraska the number of schools that have that type of academic achievement. You can see graduation rates, participation, and honestly, participation is very important. If you're looking at somebody's resume and hiring, not only do you want to see a GPA, that's very important, but what else are they involved in? Can they also communicate? participate, and be active and collaborative. Those are part of the activities that go on. ACT scores, we've, we've been above the national and state average for over a decade. And the last couple of years, in terms of the national and the state, you can see the red for the state there. That's because every junior in the state of Nebraska takes the ACT whether they're on an IEP, whether they're anything, anybody, every junior takes the ACT at this point. And we're still well above. We take spring testing. This is language arts. Constantly, continually, two to 25 points above the state average in that regard. This is math. Again, above, and this is science. Okay. Not only is it, you know, this year or that year, but look at what we did in terms of a new math curriculum. Some may have pulled their hair out on that because math that you and I learned is not math that everybody else is learning today. It's just a different process. Two plus two is still four, okay? But there's a process to it. But look at the gains from 18 to 19 all the way across the board. So the teachers that you have, the administrators that are working and focusing on it, constantly look for 
achievement or we can grow from that. I want to ask what if the bond issue doesn't pass? There's a couple of things to go on. Dr. Tyndall and I are talking today. We're using all the rooms. We don't really have any more rooms to expand. To. Therefore, class size could rise because we simply don't have any more rooms if we can't put on any more facilities. The construction, you know, I was talking to a developer just at home. Okay? In the last four years, home prices, what used to be a $300,000 home is now a $425,000 home. Construction prices are doing the same thing. We don't know where interest rates could go. Right now they're very favorable, so we keep that in mind. And then I've talked about, we have to go to the teacher ratio, and then the last thing, we need facilities, that's not going away. So we would come back with another form of the bond issue down the road, and there's costs associated with it. You cannot come back any quicker than six months. Therefore, in all likelihood, you would lose a construction season, because that would push you back into November. And you'd lose that whole summer. There are some things that go along with online voting, okay? Not online, excuse me, mail-in voting. Number one, if you haven't registered, and keep in mind, last time a lot of people voted was 2018. And if that's the case, and you've moved into the district, chances are you're registered at your old address. Therefore, you've got to go online and register to vote in this election, or you can do it by mail. Again, Douglas County Election Commission has a form to fill out and you can mail it in. But it has to be in, in their office, not in the mailbox, in their office by February 21. If you miss that date, you can go in person and register by February 28. If you miss those two dates, then you're not voting in this election. You use ink pen. Everybody remembers filling out ballot in a pencil, they don't do that anymore. That's a change in this one. We use a blue or black ink pen. You can vote for or against and make the oval complete. This is the one in the middle that catches a lot of people. You know, I think any teacher would tell you Dr. Hawk's cheap. okay? So, if you take a ballot, it's husband and wife, or there are two people in the household, and you say, let's save 55 cents, let's just put both ballots in one envelope and then mail that. Both of them are void. Okay? There is a return envelope, and you have to sign that return envelope. And your ballot and your envelope are special, therefore, they have to go in separately. Ballot, fill it in, put it in its own envelope, sign it singly. Okay? And then you get a return. Now, we have collected those ballots over the years, and we take them down to the election commission for you. Okay? If you mail it, keep in mind, it has to be there by March 10th. Don't mail it March 10th. Mail it about or before March 5th to get assurance that it's going to get to that election commissioner office by March 10th. March 10th at 5, they count the ballots that are there, not the ones after. In summary, $72 million. The increase, if we continue at the same rate of growth, is zero on the levy. If it's slashed in half, it could be up to four cents, which could equate to $80 on a $200,000 value of piece of property. We've already approved it by the board. Special election is March 10th. I've talked about that. Why? Because of 1,500 homes in the last five years. We have averaged 11.5% growth. Keep that in mind because at 10% growth, it's a zero level. And right there at the bottom, we are not stopping in terms of the growth. It took us 10 years to go from 1,000 to 2,000. It took us five years to go from 2,000 to 3,000. It'll take us about four years at the current growth rate to go from three to four. 
Are there any questions? Yes, sir. I have a couple. Yeah. So first off, just a plug to the teachers for my kids is since we're one of the lowest spending districts, we also need to pay our teachers a lot of money. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, so the growth rate, 11.25, is that, is that what you're using to calculate the future number of students out for that many years? The 11.25 is a five years average growth over the past historic okay. So, so when you look at it in school years, I'm using that in part. Okay. okay. So, how what growth rate are you using to look at school years and go out further? I mean, is it static? Is it change? Is it what, what it does change every year, year? And I try to adjust that every year based on um, what comes in that year and based on the five year average. Okay. And so, for example, um, the 11.5% growth is a district average, but I'll take kindergarten and dropping it down in the first grade of the next year, and I typically add about 6% to that. Uh, I do that for the elementary pretty consistently, but I know there's seventh grade or sixth grade year when they go from elementary to middle school. That is typically a spot where parents move and freshmen. Those are a little higher numbers. But I also take into account you usually don't go between your junior and senior year. And so that is stagnant or 1% growth. It's adjusted per grade level. It comes out to about that growth. Okay? Yep. Can that help you? Yeah, it does. So I was just trying to, your first couple of charts, I was wondering to figure out uh, what rate you're using to get those, those growth. In, anywhere from 1% to about 8%, depending on the grade. Are there any, then that's static, so you're not counting any downturn in, in home building or anything like that. You're just saying taking the okay. five year average. Okay. Yes, you're okay. correct. Uh, the new OPS school is being built. Yes. Is that for sure going to be an OPS school, or is there any chance that that is incorporated in any way of independent? It is for sure an OPS school. Okay. Uh, when the learning community came into play um, over a decade ago, when that came in, it froze the boundaries. For example, that's different than anywhere else in the state of Nebraska. Lincoln Public Schools, as the city grows, so does Lincoln Public Schools. But in the Douglas County and Sarkis County areas, those boundaries are frozen. The only way you can trade or swap land is both school districts vote yes to do so. So that is an OPS school system. That is an OPS school. One more. Uh, sorry if I'm dominating the time. Uh, you talked about phases. So this is a $72 million bond over three years. When do you anticipate the next bond issue in the amount uh, at that time? I know that's looking out there, but obviously there's a lot of phases you're talking about there which are going to require yet more yeah. bond reaches. Um, one, one of the things I did, um, I'm just going to have to hang on from you. That's fine. So. That's why I'm trying to give a map of the next 10 years. And you can see that the next bond issue is probably for another elementary and all likelihood a second high school. I would suggest that that's going to be about three years away. Okay? Okay. I'm getting closer. Sorry. Uh, let me back up. The blue line is the boundaries, and those stay until both schools decide to do so. So even though that where the L is would be that OPS high school, that's going to remain. Bond issue basically for this year. Elementary 6, 2025. High school, 2026. Somewhere in there is going to be the next bond issue. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be a pretty big cost. Um, the land you already have in bond issue, but um, I know that Elkhorn North. At this point in time, it was between 50 and 60 million dollars. Now, what that's going to be 
five, six years from now. And so. so would it be fair to say that we might be able to anticipate a uh, large bond issue between 50 and 100 million dollars every three years until we reach matching capacity points. It would be fair to say that, but I don't know that that would be true. I think the next one will be one of the biggest, but, and I think others behind that will be small because of that high school size. And, yep, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> all, all good questions. Do you see higher property taxes to the people from the Yes, because we know the chance of Yeah. Yeah. Um there is a line and, and the board of the board of education is aware of that line. You know, at times we get asked, well, if you know you got elementary number six there, why don't you just do it now? You know, why do you keep coming at us every two to it's for that very reason that we know there is some breaking point um, that people will say, you know, that we're done. But we're about two to three pennies away from Elkhorn and Crack. And so if you say, I need a new home, okay, then you're looking at some of those areas for the most part. And if you say, oh, I like the schools, those three are pretty close together. Okay. Um, there's not a whole lot of property tax difference between each city. I just know older homes have been established for a while and lower property taxes than new homes home being built. They seem to assess them much higher. And then That's that, that could keep people from you know, building all these houses and oh, the property tax is ten thousand dollars. They have to buy another house somewhere else that's five thousand dollars for the same size house because the state does the taxes. And if you're looking at just houses and nothing else. That's true. So, but we probably get three to four calls a day at the district office talking about school. So, you made a point there. How are some of the changes in how we're going to value and tax ag land around this factor into these bond issues? Well, I can tell you that the bill 974 is not very good for them uh, because it takes ag land from 75%. Down to a 55. I don't have any problems with that. But it doesn't do much for commercial industry or residential. So if you're doing that, there's certain levers that go along with state aid. And the whole idea is if you devalue the ag land, it would bring the boat up and allow state aid to go to a lot of smaller schools. Well, there's only so much money in that state aid pot. And that would take away from the Benningtons, the OPS, the Millers, the Elkhorns to do so. There's also a lot of spending caps on that one. For example, uh, you think we have the lowest revenue now? If that was to go in, the only growth we could assess would be new growth. So any assessed valuation on property that's already out there, um, it's almost like a prop 13 out of California, you know, stays where it's at. The only thing you're assessing in schools is new growth. And so that severely limits uh, what we could do in terms of the annual budget. Now, I'm not saying that um, ag land is overvalued, undervalued, anything. I mean, I'm, I would be in favor of some sort of reduction in property taxes. But in order to do that, you have to have some other lever along with that to maintain that revenue for school. So, so going back to his first comment, is any of this money in these bonds going to go to increase pay for teachers, maybe adding school nurses to the schools? It cannot. Bond is only for capital office. The only thing that can go into the annual budget for salaries is that general that's the, we're at about 38 cents for this, and we would maintain 38 cents. The other is about a dollar five, you know, we call it a buck five. And that's still the same pot that's coming from property taxes, but in addition to that is the state aid I've talked about. And we're at our cap there. Uh, we can't 
we can't assess any more than anybody else to get there. So no, this does not go for general operating costs. All right. Again, I apologize in the So I got another hour now. I can go out find another Valentine's party. Yeah. You know, so, I sent an email today, remember your wife is tomorrow. Get her some flowers. <laughs> I should have said remember the meetings at 5.30 and get flowers. Yeah. 